Hello, hello, hello. Can y'all hear me okay? Yes. How are y'all feeling? <laughs> are y'all blessed? Y'all healthy? Y'all good? Yeah. All right, perfect. Motherfuck the bullshit, black folks do it first. If the blues rock and roll, hip hop, and I hurt. See another brother die, get tied to his shirt. So whether we hurt, but we sign to the curse. Cut for profit, this slave for a verse. No one life is a bitch, but I try not to flirt. White men be taxing the soil and dirt and the water resources that came from the earth. And I've been preaching this hope for the God that works. So my niggas need help, popping perk for the perk. Devils is creeping, I know that they lurk and they love you, they hate you, it's all in reverse. Pain. Seeking the eyes of the worst in this black, white world, don't only smoke perp. One thing is certain, this life is uncertain. Living my life so we live and we learn. Diamonds dancing so we broke as fuck, wish to move my family to a mansion. That we carry so much fucking passion, what these other rappers do it for the cameras. Niggas glorify that drill shit while they're watching in the Fred Hamptons. Why you see the Panthers as a terror squad? Joe Kraken shot up the campus. And the media's a Wikipedia, they trying to knock my culture off the atlas. While mentally we're all shackled, new puppeteers in the fear of the master. It's a flower boy raised by a wolf, you took my son for a bastard. You hate Jordan the Lucas beloved Post Malone, swear to God you niggas ass backwards. Like that? I call myself a culture cultivator. Since the age of 17, I realized I had a superpower deep within myself, and my superpower is truly my talent. My superpower is truly my mouth and my voice. My superpower is truly my intention and how I manifest and make things bloom and blossom. So welcome to the art of culture cultivation, unleashing your superpower. So before I get started, I know we talk about superheroes and superpowers, but let me, let me talk about Harry Potter real quick. <laughs> Any Harry Potter fans in the building? Yeah? yeah? All right. So this is going to be a good analogy. So I was watching uh, Harry Potter with my partner. You know what I mean? She's like the biggest fan of that. But I was like, yo, words are so powerful, right? Like, if I go, Wingardium Liviosa, like I'm about to lift a motherfucker. You know what I mean? <laughs> about to lift somebody up to a whole other dimension. And it's the same way. The same way that I maybe hear a verse from like a, a Kanye West or same verse I hear from a, a, a Kendrick Lamar or a J. Cole, it, it picks me up the same way as when Guardian Livioso in my spirit. So ultimately, Kent Washington, what are you trying to say? I'm saying this is all energy work and spell work. If I'm an artist and I'm speaking certain words into existence and to fruition, I am also practicing energy work and spell work. So if I'm rapping about killing somebody 25 times in a single track, what kind of inf influence and what kind of energy that you think you'll you start picking up on? What kind of frequencies do you think your body's gonna start picking up on? It's no different from food. So what we intake and what we bring into our bodies, into our subconscious, it has a direct influence of how we respond and react in real time. It's not to abolish anything that's negative or too, street to turned up whatever but it's about administering balance because nowadays we are lacking of balance and we see that there's hypersensitivity we see that there's not really much of a space for dialogue and understanding each other and one another so when we have that dialogue in space we can do much more so nowadays this is our modern day wand the microphone speaking into existence and i started to think okay deeper than harry potter what if hip hop was truly like a Justice League or like a DC or a Marvel, right? Cause I know for me, this would be my Superman. And if you don't know who this is, this is Nipsey Hussle. Unfortunately, Nipsey Hussle was gunned down um, outside of his own clothing store in South Central Los Angeles a few years ago. However, he's a superhero to me because for someone who came from nothing, someone who grew up, um, in gang culture, um, in a lot of ways, a product of their environment, they didn't allow them, to, you know, they didn't allow their circumstances to hold them down. Could have easily just signed a regular record deal, did whatever, got a little advance, got a little chain, some bullshit car that you don't own, and masters in publishing you don't own ultimately. And then, I'll see a, a, this big cycle of artists going broke. Nipsey Hussle was changing the mold fighting for independence and entrepreneurship within artists, fighting to have more STEM programs in inner city communities, as well as Vector 90, a space where creatives, entrepreneurs, and business people can come and collaborate and work. 
It's about building community. So for me, Kent Washington, why are we bringing all this stuff up, right? Because for me, these, these people weren't in my neighborhood. <laughs> when the hell you see Batman like, going out and saving somebody like me? Like, let's be honest, let's keep it hot. Because realistically, it's wealthy white men who can buy a suit, have a butler and a cool whip, a cool car, and then I'm fighting crime. But that's supposed to be my superhero. So again, for me, it doesn't matter who the hell your superhero is, because we all have a superpower within ourselves. So if Harry Potter is your superhero, damn it, rep it proud, right? Because to me, these aren't superheroes to me. So for me, in this universe today, hip hop is the modern day like, version of superheroes. There's villains <laughs> and there's also superheroes. So in order to understand this dynamic from the top, we go start from the birth of hip hop, right? It started in New York City, we go to the 70s, the black African American art form, but it truly was adopted as an immigrant art form. The sounds from the Caribbean, the sounds from Africa, the sounds from all over that we are sampling in order to create something new and original. That's why the analogy, the rose who grew from the concrete, which is Tupac saying, is so big because we literally create things from the concrete, we create everything from the mud. So when you think about the birth of hip hop, we start with these three. We got Africa Bambada, Grandmaster Flash, and Cool Herc. These three gentlemen paved the way for this culture and this art form and this genre that was originally seen as a fad, seen as something that would not have any like longevity. How dare you take vinyl records and scratch all over it? What are you doing? What is this hippity hop? What are, you, what are you saying over this? What is this? Kind of like your, your old grandma or grandpa, like if you put like some 21 Savage on or like some little Uzi Vert. She's like, what is this? But that's what they were dealing with in the 70s. Because in New York, it wasn't commercialized. It wasn't a place where all of you all were appreciating it. It was enjoyed within the inner cities. It spoke from a place, like it spoke from the voice of the voiceless. It gave us a platform for us to speak our truths ultimately, and it didn't matter how raw or gritty or extreme it could be. We just want to be heard because we're in a place where we are not heard systemically because of systemic oppression and the systems of white supremacy still hold true and reign in our community. So when we go into the four elements of hip hop, the first element is graffiti, which is visual art. So if you're a painter, you know, whatever, this is like a part of hip-hop culture. Breaking is break dancing, b-boy, b-girl. So movement with your body is also like one of the oldest expressions known to mankind. DJing, turntablism, post-production, production. How many, you know, you see DJ Mustard and DJ Khaled nowadays producing their by record. It's not anymore about it being a table, turntablism. It's more about producing and creating uh, a track or creating a product bigger than yourself. Back then, it was about creating the experience. It was about skill. It was about doing something bigger than yourself, representing your neighborhood, representing something bigger than yourself. Last but not least, being a wordsmith and being an MC is the fourth and final element. So that's me, like a master of ceremonies, someone who can craft certain words together and evoke certain emotions and energy, energy work, spell work, to invoke and create an emotion from you all. And word of KRS one, fifth, fifth one I didn't put up here. Fifth one is knowledge. Because without community and without that knowledge, like we're just leading each other astray. So truly about each one, teach one. Now as hip hop continued to gain steam throughout, these, uh, throughout the 70s, African Bambada, Cool Herc, Grandmaster Flash, they're going out to, 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 the, to Lodo, they're going to, um, to MoMA, they're going to all these different places in New York City and working with like punk rock artists and working with a lot of different people from different genres and pretty much expanding this culture. By the time we hit the 1980s, we will be introduced to the commercialization of hip hop. Kent Washington, what does that mean? <laughs> Let's get started. This is one of the biggest record labels, this is probably the Magna Carta of record labels for hip hop. 
Def Jam Records, Russell Simmons and Rick Rubin. And this was a label that wasn't started off of a capitalistic gain. It wasn't about a p &L loss. It wasn't about the quarterly gains. It wasn't about none of that. It was about breaking and pushing through boundaries and barriers. How can you do that through sound and how can you do that through art? There hasn't been a record label like that since. And unfortunately, Def Jam doesn't follow that same model anymore. When you think of, run, when you think of Def Jam records, we think of Run DMC. You think of the Beastie Boys. You think of LL Cool J. You think of Slick Rick. And in the 80s, they actually had a tour called the Raising Hell Tour. I believe it's 86, 87, I could be wrong, but this was one of the highest grossing tours of hip hop history though. And these people have never set foot in a country outside of the US, let alone stepping outside their borough. How'd they get out of here and how they allow their, their words and their influence to reach people on a global scale? They were able to unleash their superpower within themselves and utilize hip hop as a vehicle to achieve it. And especially when you have an entity like Def Jam, who's gonna like push and fight for the artistry 100%. Shout out to Public Enemy. <laughs> Shout out to a bunch of other artists in Def Jam Records. Unfortunately, it came with a double-edged sword. So when it comes to un like unethical business practices, we were introduced to the 360 deal. So I'm not gonna break it all the way down, but a 360 deal in essence, let's see who's in the crowd. Okay, you, right there, Black Mask. You look like you have talent, you look awesome. I have a record company called Gotcha Records. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give you $100, and you have to recoup my money, but I'll also take, I, I gotta take everything from like everything that you make. So anything you make, that's all me. We, we in business? But here's the messed up part. They don't even have really the decency to even like communicate or tell certain artists what truly they're signing. So when it comes to young black artists, the 360 deal has been weaponized against them from the ages of 16 to 24. So there's a level of manipulation that come into the record industry as well. They bet on you have an enslaved mentality. Nigga, you better not know how to read and write because I could take advantage of you. And it happens to some of our favorite artists. Some of our biggest, the biggest artists you can think of, it happens to them too. There's no ownership, they don't own their IP, they don't own their publishing or their masters. So what happens to them then? Ken Washington, why is this all important? You know, if they just signed a deal that was bad for them, isn't that kind of on them? When you're 16, 17, 18 years old, and you grew up in an inner city, you've never seen 10, 20, 30,000 in your life, and someone's offering it to you because of your talent, and you never know when you're gonna make that money again, you're putting people in a, in a compromised position. Oh, you need a legal team? Oh, I got you a lawyer. But they appointed you the lawyer. So it's still a leverage on their end. So when I wrap this together, and you go into these exec rooms, and you sign that 360 deal, or you sign that record company deal. What color do you think these executives look like? <laughs> gang, 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 I'm a killer nigga down. Who's profiting off of that? Who's profiting off of beef? Who's profiting off of murder and black bodies? Who's profiting off of sexualization? Who's profiting off the violence of queer people? But I can't be mad at Kanye West. I can't be mad at another artist because there's gonna be somebody that's above them that own it. Being a culture cultivator is about owning, being an owner, having ownership. Granted, I don't wanna be Drake. Hi, it's me. I don't wanna be Drake or Kendrick Lamar. I wanna be Kent Washington. Since I was 10 years old, I've been writing raps and writing poetry in my mom's basement. So ultimately, it's about a, a center of self-expression and truly passion. So when it comes to it, 
I was like, okay, I don't want to sign a 360 deal. I don't want to go through the confines of this industry stuff. So Kent Washington, what do I do next? I go to the street, man, I start marching and start connecting with people. I think culture cultivation, and actually, let me give you all a definition, knock it out the way. Being a culture cultivator is a multi-dimensional artist with a higher level of societal purpose. What are you going to do with your talent? If you believe in God, what are you going to do with your God-given talent? You can monetize your talent all day. I think we see that with Gen Z. Songs are certain things that go viral on social media, and they leverage it, and it's about monetization, okay? So independent artists, starving artists, we are not understanding the concept of business and the importance of having ownership and being an entrepreneur. It's great to be a creative, but then it's like, well, who owns your artistry? That's a big deal because it comes with a purpose and it comes with also a double-edged sword. Signing that contract comes with taking of your IP, your intellectual property, your name, your likeness. And again, the hard work that you put, your blood, sweat, and tears is not going to be no longer yours all for a check. So since I was 17, I started opening for national artists. I was a part of a collectives that are very punk rock DIY mentality. Like I listen to a lot of metal and a lot of punk and I don't know, a lot of, I don't know, weird music, you know? <laughs> Anything that's probably not hip hop. But um, it was great because it allowed us to have self, like be self-sufficient. I don't have to worry or depend on a record label, and that is the kind of like the epitome of what artists feel like that's the, like the top. And I'm telling you now, like, that is not the top. It's an illusion. I had to break the illusion. Throughout my years, I just kept going, I kept grinding. Came to CSU, graduated from CSU, uh, year of 18. I was Ramfest coordinator. That was a part of culture cultivation, too. We helped bring Janae Aiko as the first woman headliner in CSU history. In a campus that's primarily and predominantly all mostly women. And we started Ramfest in the 70s with the Rolling Stones. So for decades, that representation hasn't been there. And ever since, we continue to keep pushing and, put, and building the mold. As I wrap up, again, you can be a culture cultivator, not be an artist. I think the biggest thing is about how you intake and instill all this information. How do you support other artists? There's not a lot of Nipsey hustles out there, you know? There's not a lot of free, uh, Big Fridas. There's not a lot of um, Janae Ecos. So ultimately, we gotta look within ourselves. The biggest thing with culture cultivation is just stepping up to the plate, y'all. Looking at yourself and like, okay, well, how can I make a difference? How can I help? As an artist, that's what I'm looking into. And as an artist, we also have to eat and win. So artists, please invest in your publishing and your masters, invest in your LLC, invest in your copyrights. And if you're not an artist, please be conscious of what kind of energy that you're intaking. Because if it's all negative and it's all just like a bunch of, you know, craziness that's gonna alter your, your insides and, and, and alter your frequencies, then we have to make a conscious decision to be like, you know what, no more. And miss us for some type of balance. So please, continue to support the culture cultivation wave. My name is Kent Washington, and thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>